Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 11, I mean, 1, 1, 11, and uh, we're just taking verse by verse, and, uh, and then afterwards, that we will just have a time to pray, and a time to worship, and just seek the Lord for a season. So tonight, we are picking up in chapter 11. Last week was a different week. It was looking at the table of nations, name by name, and where all the people of the world scattered. But then I believe also the continental drift happened, and the land that was all together in one broke off into the world that we know today. And so we focused on a guy by the name of Nimrod. You guys remember him. And uh, a lot of different stories because from Babylon and that spirit of Nimrod, who is the spirit of the Antichrist, has permeated the world. Even Christianity. We, we have Christmas is the time we celebrate Jesus' birth. When we know it wasn't in the middle of winter because the shepherds were out in the field. Um, they wouldn't have been out in the field. thousand foot elevation. And, um, and uh, it would have been way too cold for them and the sheep. But uh, then also Easter, we, we have the eggs and all of these things. And it comes from the Babylonian religion with the resurrection of their son, Tammuz. It mentions it in Ezekiel. It mentions it, you know, to the pure, all things are pure. I, I think those things are... Yep, I need a different microphone here. I'm going to grab this one, too. I've been talking to them about it dropping, but they're quite certain that it doesn't get dropped, but then it drops. So we can have both microphones working, I guess. Do you guys got a Bible? You're going to need a Bible. Yep, we had some. So, um, and so this Nimrod guy is now sort of the superstar of the beginning of chapter 11 here. And are we okay here? We're uh, echoing, guys. Yeah. <laughs> What, Josh has an idea here. Is that what it is? You could have, you could have said that. I don't know if that's going to do it. I, I hear the, the humming. Yeah. We need to figure out why this is dropping. It didn't do it Sunday, interesting enough, but. Yeah, it's not the case. It's not the case. You can have two or three mics. Do you ever see the president get interviewed? <laughs> yeah, it's really. But thank you for all of you technical uh, sound experts out there. <laughs> we have obviously everybody is so just you know help out. These guys need some help. Ah, there we are echoing again. Okay. It, it's it's. You got your PhD and sound sound technician. You can talk and tell them to just. The problem is my wife's always right, and that's what I hate about it. Okay, are we still? Nope, we're doing good, guys. Okay, nope. There's a little echo there. Okay, Lord help us. So in chapter 11 here, it says in verse one, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now, the land of Shinar, it mentions it in Daniel, Daniel who clearly went to Babylon, but in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, it says that him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all taken to the land of Shinar. Now, to... With uh, our emails, if you're not on the email list, you might want to. Uh, today, Jenny sent out as well a YouTube uh, that I 
found a really cool. The guy last year, I think, year before, went to ancient Babylon, and he's like the only one there. There's really no roads getting going in. It's not a tourist destination, but clearly it's the ancient site of Babylon. And they have one part of a structure. They say that is the part of the Tower of Babel that still exists. Herodotus, in around 450 uh, BC, said that he still he went there and actually climbed on the ancient part of um, the Tower of Babel that had still been there, and that was 500 years, 400 years before Christ. And so they journeyed from the east. Remember who they, everybody was? They were at Mount Ararat, right? And they, they traveled, and uh, they, they came to this place, which was, again, if you look on the map, it's the site of where uh, at the Garden of Eden was. Okay, so really they're going back to the Garden of Eden between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Now, this site today, if you think of Baghdad, and you go 45 miles south and a little west, you'll come to a place called Hilla, Hill, H-I-L-L, and then A-H, Hilla. And it's right there in that area where it's at. And then you go about 225 miles down, you come to the Ur of Chaldees, almost to um, the, the Gulf there, the Persian Gulf, but not quite. And that's where... Abraham, that whole area, almost to Baghdad, all the way to the Persian Gulf, is known as the Babylonia area, or also the cradle of civilization. And uh, it's pretty much established worldwide, even to this day. That's where man originated uh, from. And so um, they journeyed there. Now notice what they, they say to each other in verse thir- three and four. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly, that they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top goes into the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we scatter abroad over the face of the whole earth. So like they were supposed to do. You remember in Genesis 9, when they got off the ark, God said, okay, like I said to Adam and Eve, I'm saying to you guys now, go into all the world and multiply and spread to the four corners of the world. Do you remember that? But this guy, Nimrod, and and these guys are saying, no way, forget God's plan. We're not going to play into that. We're not going to get spread spread to the four corners. Well, we're going to stay together. And we're going to build this giant tower. And we're going to go right into the heavens. Now, I don't think they literally were trying to go so, so high, you know, where they touched the moon or something. If they wouldn't have started in a plane, they probably would have started on top of a mountain or something. But uh, the plane of Sinar, but they definitely had in their mind that this thing would be in rebellion to God and they would have their own type of worship that uh, would be something they built and be proud of and unify them uh, in. And uh, again, they had the knowledge. It's interesting. Remember in Genesis 6, they used the pitch, the tar, to uh, uh, make the ark uh, waterproof. But we see their spirit. Psalms 127, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman always watches in in vain. And then in James 4, listen to this spirit, this same demonic, secular spirit. In James 4, verse 13 to 16, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is Is it not even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, now this is the person who submitted to the will of God, if the Lord wills. And we live. <laughs> we don't die. 
We sh- and we'll say, if, if I'm alive, if God allows me to live another day, we'll do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. And listen, all such boasting is evil. It's interesting during the tribulation period and at the end of the tribulation period, they were going to see the same spirit. And it talks about it in Psalm 2. Just looking at verse 1, 4, the whole psalm is, but we're just going to look at the first four verses. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Boy, Tower of Babel, there it is. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed Messiah, Jesus Let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. And so here we see this spirit in the Tower of Babel that they're building. And in verse 5 through 8, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of Ben had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Wow. This unity in a demonic spirit of rebellion against Christ, it's going to work for them. And so the Lord says, come, let us. Remember that from Genesis 1, let us make man in our own image. It's the triunity of God talking to one another, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Let us go down there and confuse their language that they may understand, may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. So, This is an anthropomorphic statement. God's everywhere at once. God is not learning something new, like, oh, wow, what's going on? I think there's something happening over there in in Babylon. Do you get anybody know? No, I don't know. We better go check it out. These are words to help us relate to God. It's to help us understand. But God knows all things. He knows the beginning, the end, and everything in between. He knows every hair upon our head. He, he is everywhere at once. He is all-knowing. So he, he's not um, just finding out this for the fact. He, he already knew. But it's for us to relate uh, to him. And so he comes down and he sees this. And, and he, once again, he sees this spirit. Remember after they got off the ark and they made an offering, and it was beautiful to God, and it smelled beautiful. And he said, oh, I received this, but I am not unaware that even though at this moment is a special moment with you guys who just got off the ark, that the heart of man is still not, the heart of man is still evil continually. And so a very short time, The whole world was unified in perversion and violence, and God flooded the world. And now Adam and his sons get off the ark, and now we see a time a few generations later, and the earth is united again against the Lord. Wow, how quick that happens. And this is why I think you, as you read through the Psalms, David keeps coming back to those things saying, Lord, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I, I want to know. I, I can't see it. I need you to help me to see when I'm being this secular, humanistic, not putting God in the center of things, leaning on my own understanding rather than acknowledging you in the midst of that situation. And again, I I am amazed what man can accomplish. (laughs) God really did make us pretty amazing, didn't he? 
Of course, now we, we can see on YouTube some, some of the most amazing singers and most amazing piano players and guitar players. And, and then guys can come up and they do the craziest things. And you're, you're just looking at this going, how is that even possible? You know, um, some kind of a weird trick they can do, bending their body backwards or um, all kinds of, you know, paintings, interesting, uh, making a painting. And it looks like it's there on the table, but it's not. It's actually a drawing some guy did from a pencil. Well, and then I don't know if you've ever seen like some of the great buildings or, or bridges that defy gravity. I mean, some of these bridges in China and Taiwan and, and uh, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong and, and India, it, it's amazing, some of these things. You're just, you're looking at it going, does this really exist? And it does. And, and you're just, it's something that you just sort of stand in awe of and look at going, wow. It took every bit of their mathematical building. It took every one of their physicists in their country to get together to figure out how to make that possible. But they done it. So God did make man. Remember what he said in Genesis 1? It was very good when he made man. But I think that we see the results of free will. God doesn't stop us in our free will. But yet, how wicked we can come so quickly when we don't get our eyes on the Lord where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And uh, here, again, the Lord just very matter-of-factly going, yep, they're at it again. <laughs> and they're going to do this for a while. They're going to keep spinning out. They're not going to be scattering to the four corners of the earth, like I said. They're not going to be multiplying. They're, they're, they're making this situation where they all stay together. And, um, and so the Lord says, I'm going to scatter them in their languages. Interesting, Romans 1 tells us how bad it can get when man will not acknowledge God as God. In Romans 1, verse 28 to 32, you probably know this passage well. But even as they did not like to what? Retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. There you go. Disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. They can't just do it themselves. They've got to encourage to get a whole parade of it going. You know, get a, you know, get a whole mass of people under some flag and, and, and they want to make it this people group in, in the face of God and rebellion to God and saying, no, we are what we are. You may have created man, male, and female, but we're not going to acknowledge either one of those genders. We're going to be what we want to be. And, and uh, like it or not, God, this is what we are going to do. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, the Lord said. And so he went down and confused the languages. Now, I've traveled a bit, and I am amazed sometimes how a word in our language that's very dirty or vulgar or means something sexual in another language means kiss or to hug. And, and sometimes you're listening to them talking, and it's just like, you know, your hair goes out of the back of your neck, you just sort of cringe. And then you, you find out, oh, no, that's their word. So it must have been weird at that Tower of Babel. Some guy's like, hey, would you pass me a hammer? And, and he heard something vulgar and horrible. And all of a sudden, they're punching at each other, and they don't even know why. Because they just had a complete difference on, on the language. And so God... In Adam and Eve, 
And then in all men had within us all of these possibility of languages, but they just had the one language that they stayed with. And I just want to make it clear, God is the one who created these languages. And you know what? It tells us in Revelation 7, 9 that all of the nations and the people and the languages were in heaven praising God together. God loves all the different colors of skin. God loves all the different nationalities. God loves all the languages and they're all going to be in heaven together. And it's beautiful to him. Well, what's it going to be like with all those different languages? Probably like the day of Pentecost. Remember when the church was building a church, not their church, it was the Lord's church. The church that God was building wasn't a structure. It was the body of Christ, the believers. And it started in a prayer meeting. And the Lord began to build the foundation of the church in days of prayer. And it went on and it went on. They started with 500 people and it whittled down to 120 people. It's hard to get people to pray and keep praying. Even if they see Jesus ascend into heaven who says, stay there. Don't leave until the promise of the Father has come. Even if Jesus in his resurrected body ascending into heaven tells them to pray, 380 of them lose heart and stop. But nevertheless, they, they prayed. Remember what happened? Even though all the people in Jerusalem who spoke all the different languages came, those who were speaking these wondrous praise of God heard them as if they were all in the same language. So in heaven, I, I think somebody will be speaking their language, but they'll hear and understand everybody in all the various languages. Pretty interesting. I don't know. That's a speculation on my part. But that uh, Tower of Babel was undone when everybody was together in the church in one spirit. So in verse 9, it tells us, therefore, its name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Man, Chuck Smith has a great sermon on this chapter 11, verse 1, 1 through 9 on Babylon. But it, the point he makes is that this is the spirit of religion. Man wants religion. Man likes religion. Man likes tall buildings that reach into the heavens with stained glass. They like giant things that, that are monstrous that make you feel like we're great and we're substantial and we're, we're beautiful and, and people got to take notice of us and our giant building because we're something. We're making a name for ourselves. And we're doing it in the name of God. But it just amazes me when I think of Jesus wearing just regular clothes. He wasn't from their seminaries, and the Pharisees hated the fact that he wasn't from their seminaries. He just taught the common man and, and treated them as equals, and they hated that fact that they didn't have a caste system, that everybody's afraid of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin because we're religious people and everybody needs to be in fear when I walk by or you know, respect me, kiss my ring or whatever. And you think of that simple Jesus of Nazareth by the Sea of Galilee, and then all of a sudden you picture the Pope in Rome. And it's like, wow, how did they get to these robes that cost $20,000 maybe or more? These grand poobah hats and incense swinging and candles burning and people kneeling down and kissing the ring. And, and uh, years ago, uh, Francis Schaeffer back in the 70s said, I got to go to Rome. And when the Pope came out, they 
announced, and here is the servant of servants. And he came out in a cart that was being carried by a group of men. And when it came time for him to get off the cart and to go to the pulpit, he couldn't stand up because of the amount of gold necklaces that were around his neck. He was an old guy, but he literally had to have guys help him stand up and get the chains, take the weight of the gold chains for a minute so he could stand up. And yet, people could not see the irony in this servant of servants. And so really, when you think about it, this spirit of Babylon, demonic as it is, it's very religious. You know, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be very religious. He's going to make the whole world, whether you're an atheist or not, quit being an atheist, because we're all going to worship. And then he's going to make a very specific way of worshiping, and he's going to be at the top of the pyramid. You're going to worship him, but not at first. First, he sort of rolls it out slowly, and then he eventually evolves it to where, by the way, it's me that you're worshiping. But you think about it. It's all about man's works to reach God. Do you understand? All the religions of the world is that. Man's work to reach God. Christianity, it's about grace, which is what? God reaching out to man. Religion is me trying to be holy so I can reach God and I need to be better and I need to pray more and I need to give more and I need to go to church more and I need to be holier in my mind and in my life and, and, I, and I'm beating myself up but I just keep building bricks because I'm going to get there and, and I'm striving and I'm stressed but man, I've got God, please God, I know I'm in a horrible situation but hey, you know, look at all this effort, all this sweat count all my religious activity as something admirable in your eyes. And Jesus is saying, no, what I'm bringing you will give, take away the strain and the stress and the striving. I come to you as a shepherd and the sheep hear my voice and they come and they find the shepherd who's gentle of heart. And in his presence, they find rest for their souls. And in his relationship with him, if you're struggling, it shows us in Isaiah that he just picks up that lamb and carries him in his bosom, anoints his head with oil, pets him, rubs him, takes care of him. You see, it's just one is demonic, it's all about the religion. When you're right with the religion, then you're right with God. If you're not right with the religion, the organization, you can't be right with God because we are the organization tell you whether you're right with God. You, you, you see, the Catholics will say you've got to be a Catholic and you've got to be right with the Catholic Church or you're not going to heaven. The Mormons say you got to be a Mormon and you got to do what we say as a good Mormon. And if you're not a Mormon, then, then that's, I'm sorry. The Jehovah Witnesses say you got to be a Jehovah Witness. The Muslims got to say you got to be Muslim. The Hindus say you got to be Hindu. You got to be a part of the religion, you see. But Christ, who easily could have said, guys, we're going to start this organization and we need to figure out who's going to be secretary, treasurer, vice president. And uh, we need to, you know, figure out how this is all going to work on a pyramid. Here, I drew this out on this scroll. Here's the pyramid. I'm at the top. And then, you know, here's the vice presidents under me. And He never talked about that. He never talked about buildings. He never talked about organizational structures. He just simply said, go into all the world and tell them what I've told you. Teach them what I've taught you and let them become a disciple. The thing they need to get is that they can't just say, oh, thanks for the information, see you later. They've got to become a learner of Christ as all of the disciples were learners of Christ and all their disciples were learners of Christ. We all just start following Jesus and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's so simple. It's so at rest. But yet we love it. We love the religion. Because it, it 
feeds our flesh. It makes our flesh feel like, wow, this is right. And the person says, I'll get you to heaven. You just come on this time and go to the confessional booth like this and open your mouth when I tell you to open your mouth and chew on this and drink this and, and say this prayer ten times and, and, and you do this. And you don't have to wonder whether you're going to make it. I guarantee you, you will make it because our organization will get you there. I remember uh, being in Mexico City and seeing people on this uphill slope, in, in between two lanes of highway, two lanes of highway was a center area of asphalt going up to the basilica. And all these people on their knees crawling because the Catholic Church said if you'll start and we're way back at a certain place and crawl uphill for two miles, when you get there, you can tie a ribbon onto the gate and God will answer your prayer. But the they eventually had so many ribbons on the gates, the priests would come out and cut the ribbons off, so people started putting locks on there. But then they started cutting the locks off, but now these guys, they get locks that nobody can get off. And the, and the gate is about bent over because all of the locks that are... But I'll tell you, it'll break your heart when you see some 80-year-old lady just so earnestly striving. Oh, her knees are killing her and she's moving. And sometimes the grandkids will show up with little sections of carpet and put it in front of her as she tries to. And you look at that going, I hate Satan. I hate religion. And God, search my heart and get all of that liberal, or excuse me, all of that religious junk out of my heart. We just simply have that fellowship with the Lord. Man, well, sir, Chuck had a great sermon. You should have heard it. Um, <laughs> but it goes something like that. And so the Lord scattered them abroad. But guess what? This Babylonian spirit went with all of the people on the earth, wherever they went. And so when you go... To Egypt, it comes back to Babylon. When you go into Africa, it comes back to Babylon. Wherever you're at in the world, and you know Jesus, he, they had a version of Judaism that was unknown 400 years before Christ when they left. Where, where did they all have to go to? Do you remember Daniel and Shadrach? Where were those guys at? Babylon. Oh, and when all the Jews left Babylon and came back to Israel, they created this Pharisees. Where, where is that in the Bible? Sadducees, where is that in the Bible? Sanhedrin, where is that? And all of these other rules that, that begin to 1,500 pages in the Mishnah on how to keep the, the Sabbath holy. All of this religion. And guess what? Jesus had nothing to do with that cult. It was a Jewish cult that was just full of Babylonian garbage. And it was oppressing everybody. But the people at the top, the people at the top were doing great. <laughs> but everybody underneath was oppressed and in fear. And, and the, the, the yoke that this religion was putting on them was smashing them. And these religious leaders weren't helping them even a tiny bit. They were fine to just say, yep, this is the way religion should work. You should be afraid. You should feel guilty. You should do, try to do more. And if you're not doing more, you should feel guilty about not doing more. And, and just this constant, like, oh, man, I'm feeling God. I'm feeling religion. I'm feeling not a good Jew. I'm not a, oh, I broke that law. I didn't mean to. And, yeah, this is, this is where we want you to be. Just stay right there. We control you, just like every religion. But what did Jesus say? Your father is not God. He's my father. Your father's the devil. He hates me like you hate me. He's a liar like you guys are. And those who you proselyte and get them into your religion, they're twice the sons of hell as yourself. You're a bunch of whitewashed tombs of dead men's bones. And Jesus comes on the scene, a simple guy with a simple message. 
where people can just trust in him. God loves the world. He sent his only begotten son. Whoever believes shall not perish. Whoever believes shall have eternal life. End of story. That's the message that we have. It's so unreligious that people balk at it because we're, they, they want to come to, to a Calvary Chapel like this and they want some of their religious things checked off, you know? And we too, we're, we're always fighting it. We're always on the verge of turning things into a religion, you know? Uh, on Wednesday nights, I said, let's just sing a song for five minutes and let's start into the teaching. Oh, man, no, you can't do that. It's got to be at least 22 minutes long. 30 is better. Where in the Bible does it say we have 30 minutes of singing before you start the, 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 the teaching? Where, where is that? But our religion, we like it. Our flesh likes it. I've been doing that 30 minutes thing for forever. You know, my whole life. We come in 15 minutes late and we still get to sing 15 minutes. I, I, I love that religion. And we go this long. If you go any longer than that, I don't like it because our religion, this is how long we go. We, we all are on the verge of this. Well, I'm not going to take time tonight, but in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, God finally destroys Babylon <laughs> before he begins to create the millennial reign. But it, it's, it's this woman of wickedness who martyrs the saints. She's the mystery Babylon, the great, drunk in the blood of the saints and of the martyrs. And John looked at her, at the end of in uh, chapter 17, verse 6, and it says, he marveled at the great with great amazement. What did he see when he saw this great Babylon? It was lovely. It was magnificent. It was a structure that went into the heavens, and, and it was amazing. And it's like, how, who can resist this? Who can, who can stand against that beauty that sensuality, that, that yearning to come into that, it's just like, I, I marvel how anybody cannot take the mark of the beast and be a part of that system in the tribulation period. If, that, if that's your plan B, to, to you know, get saved in the tribulation period, I, I wouldn't do that. Just have plan A. Do not have a plan B. Plan A is give your life to Christ and follow him. But eventually, in, in Revelation 18, Babylon is thrown down. Now we come back, and we actually see here in chapter 11 a repeat from chapter 10 on the kids of Shem. Remember, the first son of Noah was Shem, but he's the last one in the genealogy of chapter 10 we looked at last week. But the reason he was last is because he is where Abraham comes from. And so in verse 10 through 25, I'm not going to read this, but we see these great great grandparents of Abraham Shem and Arphaxad and Sala and Eber and Peleg. There's two new ones that weren't in chapter 10. In verse 19 of Genesis 11, Ru, and then uh, in verse 21, uh, Serug, um, those two guys were not mentioned in chapter 11 or in chapter 10, but now they're here in chapter 11. And what he does here is he says how old they were when they had kids and then how old they were when they died. And so I put this graph together so we can sort of take a look. Shem lived to be 500 years old, which, you know, half the age of uh, Noah lived 950 years old, remember? So that, a big difference happened between Noah and his son. But then Arphaxad, he was 35 years old, mid-30s when he had a kid. Yeah, that's about right. And, and he died at 430 years. Wow, that's, that's still up there. But then the next guy, Salah, 30 years old when he had his kids, and he died at 403. And then Eber, where we get the name Hebrew from, 34 years old. And he died at 430 years. He, he lived as old as our fox died. And then uh, you have after him Peleg. Remember, that's when the continents 
a continental drift happened. I believe the, the languages, the Tower of Babylon, after that, the continental drift in its generation. But he was 30 when he had his kids. He died at 209, about half. Things just sort of dropped in half again. So Arfaxad, it dropped in half. Or Shim, I mean, it dropped in half. And then right now, Peleg, it dropped in half. And then Ru was 32 years old when he had kids, and he died at 207. And then um, Sarug was 30 years old when he had kids, and he died at 200. And it continues. This is exciting. We're not done yet. You got more, right? You have more? You have more, right? Yeah, let's go. Oh, there we are. Um, then um, we got Nahor, 29 years old. And he lived to be 119, sort of dropped in half again. Keep going there. And then we get to Terah, who is Abraham's father. He was 70 years old when he had his kids. Boy, chip off the old block. Abraham, remember, was 100 when he had Isaac. Of course, he was younger when he had Hagar. Or he had Ishmael through Hagar. But 70, that's about when he had uh, probably uh, Ishmael through Hagar. But anyway, he died at 205. But I thought it'd be interesting to see how it keeps breaking down. Remember, God had said after the flood, man's days would be 120. And this is what we see. Go to the next thing there. Yep, Abraham was 100, and Abraham died at 175. And then Sarah, his wife, died at 127 years old. She did pretty good. Isaac died at 180. And then Jacob died at 147. Remember in the end of Genesis, we're going to say, when he meets Pharaoh for the first time, he says, oh, 130, I can't remember now, 35 years I've lived, evil and harsh have been my days. Keep, keep, just put them all up there. You got Joseph died at 110. Moses died at 120, which was old. Everybody's like, wow, he had lived a long time. And then Aaron, his brother, died at 123. Joseph, or Joshua, excuse me, died at 110. David died at 70, and Solomon died at 70. And, and that's so you, you see in just a few generations the length of man's life working its way down. Well, we now want to come to verse 26 to 28 there. Now, Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram and Nahor and Haran. He had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in his native land, that is the Ur of the Chaldees, about 225 miles from Baghdad in the area called Nazaria, Iraq today. And um, just to let you know, Abram is mentioned 312 times in the Bible in 272 verses. Absolutely amazing. And in verse 29 to 30, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, who was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Ishkar. So, uh, and then it says Sarah was barren. She had no kids. So Abram married Sarai. Sarai was his half-sister. They had the same dad. Now, we're going to find out they were living with their dad. That's just got to be weird. Sarah was Terah's daughter, but also his daughter-in-law. That's got to be some kind of riddle, right? How, how can you be a daughter and the daughter-in-law of one man? Well, they figured it out. But then his brother, Nahor, marries his niece. Pretty strange at this time. But my guess is, is that when um, their brother died, um, Haran died, that Abraham took Lot, and it probably appears that his brother Nahor took the niece, Milcah, and they raised them. And when Milcah came of age, she, he married her, which was common practice in those days, as strange as it is to us today. Well, then verse 31 and 32, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the son of Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah 
were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Then moving right into chapter 12, we're going to cover this next week, this chapter, but I wanted to read these first three verses. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. God now chooses Abraham. So the thing is, is if we see Noah getting off the, the ark and he mentions his three sons, and then the next thing you got Abraham, you're going, where did this guy appear from? So I think they realized it, so they went back and, and put together this genealogy. Because all of a sudden, Abraham's going to be meeting some guy, Pharaoh in Egypt. Where did he come from? And then he's going to be going and seeing another group of people. That uh, Abimelech is, where did all these people come from? What was the sense at this time? This isn't that long. As a matter of fact, Abraham is alive when Shem is alive. Yeah, Noah's son. So there was a sense of all the people on the earth that, hey, we're cousins. <laughs> it's, it's, there's not this like, oh, these are foreign people. I think that people started getting nation, looks of nationality, different colors of skin, obviously languages. Uh, some were tall, some were short. I, I think we start seeing this kind of thing happen. But they all had a sense of, hey, we're cousins. We're all, we all got off the boat together. <laughs> we all came off the boat. And it wasn't that long ago. And so we shouldn't be distant. So now as we go through Genesis and we see sometimes these people calling Abraham, one of these guys, their brother. Hey, brother, <laughs> what are you treating me like this for? Abimelech says, well, it's because they were, there was a sense at this time that they all were still family. Even though they spoke different languages and, and looked different, they all understood. They we're together from the same family on this earth. Well, we got through the tough part, the first 11 chapters. There's actually a graduation ceremony. There should be, getting through those first 11 chapters. But now it starts rolling. We're going to have some awesome stories and learn some great doctrines about faith and salvation. And, but um, you guys have done so well, especially last week getting through chapter 10. And uh, I know you guys have learned so much. Well, Lord, thank you again for your word here tonight. And thank you for drawing us to yourself. And we just ask again as we come here and just say, Lord, please circumcise our hearts. And let us put away all of this self-centeredness. It says in Proverbs 3, in all your ways acknowledge God, and he'll direct your paths. We don't want to be a, a, that of a humanistic spirit or a secular spirit. God's in heaven, I'm on earth, he's observing, but I got to do what I got to do. No. If your will is that we live tomorrow, and if your will is we're submitted to you, and we want to hear of your spirit and walk in the spirit, take us to the right, take us to the left. Let us not be like the horse or the mule that has to have a bridle or has to be hit on the rear with a shovel. Let us be the one, Lord, that just looks at you. And all you got to do is, with your eyes, give a little direction, and we are right in step with you and your spirit. 